other things, such as strong voice. Um, so if we have creators that are just starting out, and they're only in their first year, putting out their first books, and they're just learning everything, and they're tailing at a convention with people that have been doing it for a while, and they can kind of all join together as one voice, and it brings more people to their table, I think. Well, and it's really nice for you know myself as a beginner, and I'm sure Colin will attest to this too, to have these guys that are a little more experienced, a little more veteran, they've been around the block a little bit, they've done it, they've met people. I mean, Jason's fantastic at introducing you to other people, like some of the bigger names that we're tabling next to that you might be a little, I don't know, intimidated or shy to be like, hey, uh, you're published by like the major publishers and I'm just this guy that's doing this in my basement. Um, can you give me some tips or do you want to check out my comic book maybe? And he's just like, hey, I know this guy, I can introduce you to him, it's great. I have no filter, I just go up and talk to people, so by default, you have to come with me. <laughs> and I have no problem with that. As a teacher, I talk too much sometimes, so sometimes I get a little closed off. I'm just like, you know what, I'm not in a people mood right now. Just take his picture, put it on No, this is live streaming right now. <laughs> yeah, I know. It'll give up eventually. Yeah. So, our favorite CCBA character that's not ours. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, um, my favorite CCBA character has got to be, that's not my own or anybody else's on this table, sorry guys, uh, it would be Oric of the Great White North, and he's done by Great North Comics out of Ontario, uh, Andrew Thomas and Davis Dewsbury. Dews um, do a fantastic job. It's an amazing comic. I've been on board pretty much from the start. And they're just, they're fantastic people to work with and it's a great book, so much fun. My personal favorite, uh, it's a tie, because I really like the horror movie. Well, I appreciate it. I like it's drum, so it kind of biased that way. Okay. But I also really like Jack Grimm. Yes. Uh, I remember your death, Gary's doing a great job on that book, he's having a lot of fun with it. See, to me, that's the big part, is, is the artist writer having a good time with their, their book? And you can kind of see that in what he's doing, and he's having just a great time doing what he's doing. Uh, and he's also a great person, so I want to see him succeed. I want to see everybody succeed, but I'm really, really proud of what he's doing. Um, he's actually managed to promote himself to the point where he got to work on a cover with Dave Sim from Cerebus this month. And I got to admit, I was like, he's oh, blown away. It's yeah, that was, that was unreal. I mean, yeah. that's, that's one of like the books when it comes to Canadian independent books. So to have him be able to get enough reputation with these guys that they're like yeah we want you to do a cover for us that's awesome stuff and I do echo it Gary's book is awesome myself it's a tie between Jack Yeah, it really is. They're all so good. Mine's the bird that keeps flying around here. <laughs> that bird is These guys are so absorbed in what they're saying, they don't even notice the animals around there. <laughs> well, it's just because he came from your table, so. If, if he would stop storing breadcrumbs in your pockets, he would stop falling in the But I do it with my own time. <laughs> and my own breath. It's <laughs> my It is currently out. It's actually on the Aurora Man table and also on James's yeah, table. Yeah, it's the uh, the Adventures of Aurora Man annual number one. So at my table and at James's table, you can find that copy. It's making its Saskatchewan debut this weekend. So. And I charge less than Jeff. <laughs> Since when? Because I have more than you. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you charge whatever you want. That's your your loss. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for your questions. Yes, yeah, good questions. All right, you two down there need to, you know, ramble a little bit. <laughs> Actually, I have a question for my table mates. Seeing how the uh, CCBA was partially my idea and bringing it together. By partially, I think he means fully his idea. No, I 
have a, I have a slightly silent to remember that uh, it was really his brain wave and he gave it to me and said, hey, you should do this. And I foolishly said, hey, that's a great idea. I'm going to do this because I'm not busy enough already. Let's organize all these people. Um, but tell me why you decided to jump on board and tell everybody else, not just me, uh, why you decided to jump on board. What was it that appealed to you about it? And I mean, we're technically a year into this being a group of people. Um, how do you feel about it? I was told there would be cookies. There's no cookies. Come to the Humboldt Summer Sizzler, I'll bring donuts. All right, I'm gonna hold you to that. <laughs> um, I joined because I think, um, I think the main reason I joined is it's just, I know everybody that's in it for the most part. And I like collaborating with everybody already as it is. And I think sometimes as a creator, you get kind of stuck in that, you know, you're, you're, you're doing your own thing all the time. And it's nice to have other people doing the same thing you're doing yeah. to talk to. And, um, and everybody's just so supportive. Well, very it was much just so. really a no-brainer. Like, yeah. Joining it wasn't it wasn't like should I join? Should I not join? It was it was easy. It was what are the pros? What are the cons? Yeah, no, there weren't any cons. It wasn't like joining the CCBA meant I was signing away my rights to my characters. It was just hey, there's this group of creators who also do what you're doing in Canada. Let's get together and let's keep doing what we're doing, but have some fun. And, and so I, I love I love being in it. Um, I mean, the year has flown by. Um, I wish our card thing had turned out. We'll so get there, bad, but we'll get there. Uh, I still have all the trading cards. Well, I have so, I have know. the set at my table. So. Yeah, and, and, and because somebody wants to take some of it for the winter. <laughs> timing, 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 timing. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I think no regrets. I mean, no. I, I love everything we're doing. I love seeing. I really love seeing what people are doing. Like when I lend my character out to somebody else's playground, seeing what they do with it is yeah. just so interesting. Like I was flipping open the book and seeing my character on the same page as you know, James's character, and Colin's character, and your character. I was like, the kid in me was like, oh yeah, you know. I was just super stoked. I didn't care what happened in the book. <laughs> you know, they could have erased him from existence in the book, and I still would have been like. Yeah. Uh, the story the story was secondary to the fact yeah. that you know it was just all this awesome characters in one spot hanging right. out together doing their thing I also love that there's like zero ego there's nobody in there trying to push themselves over everybody else yeah it's yeah and that's and that's just it we are we and I think that's part of the reason why we work together so well is there isn't that big ego other than James and his pigeons back there it's it's I'm a pretty sure level playing things. ground He's building a nest for you. How about yourself, Colin? What's your favorite time? Uh, for myself, it's, it's that real community vibe that we all have. And we just have everyone who gets along. It's like sitting in the race and making bonds with your friends when you're doing it. It's just everyone's friends, everyone gets along. Everyone goes back and forth with characters and we just have a fun. We're keeping it fun, keeping it fun, and yet we're all succeeding. Yes, I think one of the things that also has been really awesome is making those those networking connections. Like, there's that we you know now we have a printer out in Ontario who we all have access to who will print our stuff, and so as a group we're all saving money. Like we're helping each other sort of muddle our way through the business side of things too, which is really nice. Well, it's, it's nice to have a little bit of that uniformity, right? You know, yeah. we, our books are all, or generally all, the same quality now and everything like that. And, I mean, the, the member that's the printer, he's doing indie comics himself, too. So he knows what we're looking for. And he knows how hard it can be to find a printer that'll work with smaller print runs and stuff like that, that indie creators. So, I mean, really, that's the, one of the biggest expenses is the printing. So when you go to a printer and they're like, yeah, we want you to have a minimum of a thousand. Well, for an indie book that's trying to get established, a thousand books is a lot of books to be sitting on for a while. And you pay for them up front. So 
right away you're starting behind the ball on all of this expense stuff and you go to shows and you're just like okay I gotta it, it can take some of the fun out of it when you're worried too much about I have to make much, this much money back in order to be successful whereas with this it's like well this isn't hugely expensive so I got a print run now I can go sell books and have fun at the show interacting with people and not be so worried that oh I have to make this sale I have to make this sale Right. Thing is, you don't worry about the quality of the book, how it works. Um, a lot of printers they send you a proof. Yeah, that looks good. So it burns it or not. A Rondo, he prints it. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to send it to me. Well, and he, the first book he printed for me, he had uh, printed about 200 copies and realized that there was something about it that he didn't like the quality of it. And he junked the 200 copies that he had already made and started the print run fresh at a better quality. He's really particular about that. So, yeah, we don't have to worry at all. I'm like, he sends me a photo. I was like, all you're doing is making me want you to get it in the mail faster. I, I know already that it's going to be good. He also does the printing for the service stuff. And I thought if he's good enough for Dave Sim, who has a very, very particular eye very much. for print quality, then he's going to be more than good enough for me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Your turn. Yeah, I forget what the question was. The uh, printing just, what, no, just about joining the CCBA. Like, why? Uh, I think it was, you invited me to the Facebook group and I didn't know what was going on and it somehow got looped into us all. <laughs> Dragged you in, kicking and I screaming. I just became an unknown member. And now i got a t-shirt so I'll just show up. <laughs> Yeah, you're bringing the flock with you now. Yeah. He's brought the posse with him. He's got pigeons, so we have to keep them. Got to keep the crowd under control. <laughs> <laughs> now, if it really flew out, then what? <laughs> People would lose their minds. So they'd be like, what? He's not giving Wait, we might control the birds. They're going to be like, we'll let you talk about it. Saints are already coming. <laughs> and people are pleased. As you can see, these guys are no fun to work with at all. It's like every day is a No, we're so, we're so serious it's so and it's just short. straight laced. We were uh. called Stone Beast. <laughs> Creating comics is a serious business. Um, sure. That's <laughs> right. I, I don't know how you quite respond to it being a serious business. I have an eight-year-old writing my one of my comics, so I mean... Well, that's just it. I mean, I have a 15-year-old, three 12-year-olds, and a 10-year-old that, you know, feed most of my ideas. So. Yeah. And when are you guys doing the skateboard trips? Those told there skateboard trips? I think you were reading the wrong panel. <laughs> Clearly, I am not the kind of person to do that. I have no Who skateboard, and I know no trips. That I, itself was a trip. I do recall you saying, though, that you and Colin were demo demoing some karate robot dancing. Oh, no, that's a, that's a painting thing. <laughs> Up front. Yeah, so that's what it's called. Yeah, so, again, as you can see, we are, yeah, just, we're a bunch of clowns having fun doing this and selling comic books and hoping to entertain people with our stories and our characters. And um, I know... Jason has done, Colin has done, I don't know, I can't remember if James has. The three of us, for sure, we've done school shows where we get invited in to talk about artwork, or in my case, writing. Uh, literacy is a big thing for me, not just as a teacher, but just in general. Uh, I'm a very avid reader and have been all my life. My kids are very avid readers. We have more books in our house than we have clothes and other things, it seems. Um, People come over and they're like, oh, you have a nice little library going there. And we're just like, yeah, it's just the kids' books. Our stuff is in the other room on the other bookcases. And um, I'm always, I always have stuff to read and I'm always giving people stuff to read. I have kids in my classroom that are like, I don't like reading. I'm like, okay, well, you have some free time. Here's a comic book to read. And they'll read it and they'll enjoy it. So I think that's the main reason I got into doing this was wanting to get kids reading and creating and drawing and that look on a kid's face when you've kind of blown their mind with something is just amazing. Uh, oh yeah. The first 3D comic book that I did, 
you know, just like the little, cause most of my stuff is aimed at a younger audience. So when the little kids come into the table and they, they put on the 3D glasses and they just, you can just see their facial expressions. They're just like, wow, this is crazy. They're well, yeah, just, and like, you know, we, did, we did the 3D Aurora Man story. Issue one of Aurora Man has eight different stories in it. One of them, I worked with Jason and we did it in 3D. I didn't think anything of it. I was like, yeah, 3D. I love 3D comics when I was a kid. This will be fun. Um, my homeroom at my school is the 910, so we're 15, 16 year olds. Uh, I took the finished art in there. I'm like, you guys got to check this out. I just got this. This is so much fun. I gave them the glasses and I showed it to them, and it just blew their minds. And I'm like, these kids have never seen print 3D anymore. That's an old school technology to me, but that's so old that it's not even something that they know about anymore. So they're they're like, can I can I grab it? Can I you know? And I have students that you know are um, English second language students. They're not from Canada and anything like that. So for them to really see something like this, they've never been exposed to it ever. So yeah, they're just like, what's going on? Like they take the glasses off and just like they rub their eyes a little bit and they put them back on and. They turn the page and they get to some of the scenes that really just jumped right out. And it's like, this is so cool. I've never seen this before. So, I, it, moments like that, that's like, that's the stuff I like to see. I mean, I'm not looking to uh, retire from my teaching job and make comics for the rest of my life as a day job. I'm looking to have fun. And those moments tell me that A, as a teacher, I'm in the right spot. B, as a comic book creator, I'm doing the right thing. So. Yeah, that's the most important thing for me is is uh, that reaction of getting the the you know when when somebody just gets it, they just get yeah. it. You know. And, and yeah, in teaching we call that that light bulb moment, right? When that yeah. clicks for a student. Yeah. yeah. Even when I do cartooning classes in a in a classroom setting, um, I often have the teachers after the class say, "I've never seen them pay this much attention to somebody before." Like we get somebody in the class and they're all goofing around. Or, kind of paying attention and she's like they were glued to you the whole time I'm like well you just got to do cartoons kids get cartoons yeah exactly well, and you give them something that's different right break yeah. it up from the, re the regular routine yeah kids figure they figure it out pretty quickly yeah, yeah. I started my own live stream <laughs> oh we're dual live, live streaming now yeah. oh, all right well James, I hate to tell you, Amanda's watching my live stream. So. <laughs> Amanda's uh, his fiance. So that that she was watching my. <laughs> <laughs> she tuned in. And she's like, "What is going on?" I'm sure she's just tired of my nonsense. Oh, okay. Well. That I've just forced upon at least ten people in the crowd. <laughs> Right on. Right on. Well, Colin, Colin, you've done you've done school stuff too. So, what is, tell us a little bit about your experience with that. Um, I got to go around to London and talk to kids about writing and drawing, just creating. And it was very well received. And one of the kids liked to draw. It was just getting the pencils in their hands, getting them around, because that's how I started. Just sketching them out. It's, <laughs> right on. Yeah, I think that's been the, the big thing for me too. Like my daughter is at an age where she's just starting to try to figure out what she wants, what she's into, what she likes to do. And uh, most days when I'm in the art studio, she's right in there with me, drawing, writing, creating, painting. Um, so I think that's 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 what the important thing is. It's not it's not just me telling stories. It's me wanting to get other people telling stories or getting them involved in doing stuff is it's, it's fun. Excellent. We just had a comment on the live stream. Andrew just checked in. Andrew Thomas from Oric we had mentioned earlier. He just checked in. He wanted to say hi to everybody. Hey, and Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Come over to the cool live stream. Yeah, you, you got to get to like the good stuff here. And another fan checked in and said, less comic talk, 
more tips on growing epic facial hair. Don't shave. That's my tip. That's the easiest way to do it. Marry somebody who allows you to have a beard. You know what? Less comic talk, more talk about tips on growing epic facial hair. Exactly. Just buy like a Santa beard and just wear it all the time. Just glue it on and away you go. Super glue is your friend? <laughs> just for men? Super glue? Take it off the top yeah. of your head and you can make your own chin. Yeah. That would also work. Two of us have figured that out. <laughs> I think Colin might be taking it from the side there a little bit. <laughs> right on. All right, uh, any more questions from the floor? Anything you want to know about our characters, our process, uh, what it's like to be doing, for the most part, Canadian-based comic books or just working as an independent Canadian creator at all? We're, we're pretty open books on that kind of stuff. It's... Yeah. Okay. Right. All right, good question. Um, so yeah, where did our creative process in developing our characters come from? Um, with Aurora Man, Aurora Man is kind of an interesting story. There was a, uh, a friend of mine that we met online through um, a mutual fandom of an American artist. And we just kind of got to know each other and developed a friendship. And one day he just sent me this, uh, this mock-up cover because I was cosplaying as a different comic book character. And he took a spin on that comic book character and said, hey, this is Aurora Man, this is your own version of this. And I looked at it and I was like, that's kind of cool. And I took it to another one of our members and I said, this is kind of neat, could we you know, do something with this? And this was before the, the Alliance was a thing, I wasn't writing comic books or anything, but he was, and he's doing a Canadian team called the Canadian Corps. Um, and I'm like, you know, what do you think of this kind of uh, character? Could we do something? So he and I took the initial idea and changed it up and revised it around until it was what Aurora Man is now. And then I said, that looks fantastic. Do you want to use him in your book? And he just, he flat out, he's like, no. I'm like, oh. He's like, well, no. He said, not no, I will, but you're going to write him. You're going to write Aurora Man as a book. And I'm just like, uh, I've never written a comic in my life. What are we doing? Um, so with his help, he helped co-script the first zero issue of Aurora Man just to kind of give me my uh, my legs on where I was going and help me take the ideas I had here and make them make sense on the page uh, in a comic book style. So Aurora Man was really a, a weird collaboration and I often feel uh, I, I, I don't want to take all the credit for it because it wasn't my thing. I just I'm running with it now and uh, it was a lot of fun though and that's kind of collaborative that's what I do so we just went with that. So that was the short story of Aurora Man, short, long story. Uh, for me, um, the, I guess the main book I started doing was Jason's New York City. Uh, I'm, a, I'm like Jeff, I'm, I think everybody up here is probably the same. We're all into reading and, and I, I like to experience different types of writing and things like that. So uh, I read a lot of uh, mythology. I read I know, right? Greek classics, uh, Hamlet, Shakespeare. I like all kinds of things. Uh, Tolkien. Um, I like I like that whole idea of building a mythos. Uh, and I've always liked the the Greek myth of Jason and the Argonauts. I just I always wondered, like, how is Jason the hero in the story? Because you know, his wife does all the work. He gets all the credit, and then somehow this guy's leading this group of like superior, you know, heroes. But he's the guy in charge. Like Hercules is taking orders from this normal dude who doesn't seem to be the most charismatic, the most, the best orator, doesn't always have the best plans, but he's got the boat. We were talking about this the other day. We think he got together because he's the guy that had the car. None of the other kids had their license for the car. So he's got the car, so they all have to go with him to go anywhere. And uh, so I always just like the idea of that character. And one day my son, he was about eight or nine years old and he wanted to start reading comic books 
And I was excited because I'm like, yeah, let's read comic books. Like, I want to get you into this great thing. But this was before they came out with all-age comics and things like Johnny DC. And they weren't DC and Marvel, and nobody was doing anything aimed at younger kids. And I couldn't buy him anything that was on the shelf. Because if I picked up an issue of Iron Man, like there was an issue of Iron Man, he looked at it, and he was super excited to get it, and then he opened it up, and they had the Hulk ripping Iron Man's head off. It was just a robot, but he was eight. So to him, he was like, oh, I don't want to read that. The Hulk's killing Iron Man. Like, I don't want anything to do with that. Yeah. And so I said, I'll make you a deal. I'll create a comic book for you. You can read it. And that's how it started. So I, I, I always loved the idea of Jason as a character. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to take a, a Greek myth character and do that stranger in a strange land thing and you throw him into the modern world and just sort of see what, what would happen with this guy. He doesn't speak the language, he doesn't know the customs. He's running around with a spear and a shield in modern day Manhattan. And then I started having you know, the idea of introducing monsters into the story. And the story just developed around the idea of putting this, this poor dude into the modern world and throwing him into the wolf, so to speak. Um, I think most of my stories kind of come about like that, very kind of organically. Like you, you get like the seed of an idea, and you kind of let it sit there for a while, and then you sort of add to it a little bit, and you add a little more, then you break it all down, and you rewrite the whole thing, and then before you know it, you've got a story that, that's worth telling, and then you kind of move on from there. I have to say, um, if I'm looking for a really good laugh, or if I'm having kind of a semi-crappy day, uh, usually picking up one of James's books is a quick fix for that. Oh. Those are supposed to be serious drawings. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm still kind of getting the hang of it. <laughs> They're very autobiographical, I think. Yes, I'm a monster from space. Like, also, you know, just, that's why I'm here, right? Not just by ship, but be a Definitely. All right, we got a question from the live stream. I hope that answered your question. Awesome. Excellent. Uh, so from the live stream, what do you think is the hardest part of being an indie creator? Shipping. <laughs> yeah, 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 shipping. shipping. Yeah, shipping Definitely. Yeah. Uh, and especially when, um, you know, Canada Post and especially uh, the United States Postal Service decides to monkey with their ship rates and stuff and... Um, sometimes it's a lot cheaper for me to ship a comic to Singapore than it is for me to ship a comic to Calgary. Um, and when that happens, it's a little discouraging, but you, know, you just kind of have to muddle through that part. Yeah, I think for, for myself, um, 
that that shipping has been a really horrendous uh, detriment. Uh, good examples for the toy. It would cost me more money to ship the toy than it would cost the person to buy the toy. Yeah. So that's it's hard to sell a product when the shipping is twice as much as the product. Yeah. Um, and also, I find I mean, we don't have a marketing budget, right? I mean, the marketing <laughs> budget is zero. <laughs> so that's also hard. It's hard to build an audience doing it person by person. Show by show, year by year, yeah. event by event. So, well, and it's it's one of those things, you know. There's so much out there to choose from that you really have to work on that marketing part to make sure that you're still staying in front of your audience so that they don't forget about you. Um, I mean, hopefully your work is of a level that they won't because they just they want more, so they're going to be looking for you. But you get those those somewhat casual fans that they like your work and they thought it was cool. But if you're not right in front of them, they might forget about it. So then it's like, well, how often do I have to put stuff out? How much do I have to um, pimp myself out on social media to make sure that I'm still staying in their, you know, immediate circle that they're like, yeah, Aurora Man or, you know, Blackthorn, Shump, Jason in New York City, any of the other CCBA books, you know, if you don't have that direct connection established right away, you really, you have to work for it. So. While you're working for it with this fan, you also have to remember this fan and that fan, and you know keep that fan base growing, keep that brand growing, so that you know eventually you're going to get people like I know Jason experiences this regularly, so it's not such a new thing. But for me, this weekend I have fans, and I I start into my pitch. Oh, have you ever heard of Aurora Man? And all of a sudden somebody says, Yeah, I have. I have some of the books, and all of a sudden I'm like, I don't know what to say now because I'm ready for the part that they're like, No, I've never heard of them. So that's yeah. that's always a fun thing. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the things that I find um, is that you, you're constantly self-promoting yourself, and you don't want to be that annoying guy that only tweets when it's to sell something new yeah. or to promote my Kickstarter. I'm gonna yeah, exactly. bombard everybody with Kickstarter links for the next month, right? Like, I don't want to be that guy. So I find that hard. Yeah, that is definitely tough. You know how much how much of me posting stuff is too much you know I'm not posting to sell all the time I'm just posting to update news and stuff and yeah I talk a lot so it just happens um, but yeah you I'm always I'm always second-guessing how much is too much of promotion and at the same time I really I just want to share I want I love this what I'm doing and I want other people to enjoy it because I know they will if they give it a chance So many things at once. Just trying to get like the Aurora annual on Comicsology. That's just a fight I didn't think I was gonna have. <laughs> Who's fighting? Is that Donovan fighting us? Oh, okay. We'll I get the account. I could have put it up. It was fun. Yeah. But that well, also fights your shipping cost thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's digital is a big thing. I, I, I was very resistant to digital at the start, just because it was. I liked the feel. I liked holding a comic book. Um, after seeing some digital stuff and reading some more stuff and somebody dragging me into some really cheap digital comics, uh, I find I quite enjoy it. It'll never replace print for me, but I see the benefit of it. And yeah, I've got the Aurora Man account is now set up and stuff, so it uh, gives another avenue that I can have people take a chance at my work, check it out, hopefully enjoy it, and see the rest of our stuff. It also helps you release a lot quicker. Yes. Yeah, it's just like as soon as it's done, it can be on there digitally. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, I sell, I sell through Amazon all the time. Um, all of my books are on Amazon.com and .ca. Um, the problem is, is that you have to wait for Amazon payments, and they take a pretty good cut. Um, so for a small creator, like for myself, it's not that big a deal because I have so many books, and we sell, and it's like I have a publisher, so I just wait for the publisher to get paid, and they pay me. But if I was just a small independent creator, and I was depending on payment to come in on a book, and they're late or the sales aren't, you know, they have to do whatever with it. Um, that might interrupt my ability to put out the next thing. Um, I find also there's a lot of white noise. So until you sort of establish yourself, like you establish your body of work or your audience, um, you don't show up all the way all the time. On the, like, for example, Create Space if you on their website, um, and and if you're doing a book, um, there might be a thousand other books on that page that launched that same day. And so they sort of list things as it's posted. So if you post it at eight o'clock in the morning and somebody else posts at 801, 802, 803, your book gets bounced further down the list as the day goes on. So you kind of battle that white noise of it. Unless people know you have a new book out and you have that kind of audience looking for you. Because as soon as people click on your book, it raises you on the search, right? So there's there's little things, there's little tweaks with, with being digital that are, that are there's good and bad to everything. Um, I like Amazon. I work with them quite a lot. Um, but I can see for a small creator, if you're putting out your very first comic book on Amazon and it's the only thing you've done, you're immediately competing with like hundreds of thousands of other people at the same time. So it's that white noise thing. So do you buy advertising then? You have to start weighing all of the different options that you have. And that's where social media plays a big part and, and things like that. So. Well, Amazon will accept anything as a return case. They're kind of like Walmart for that, right? So you might have books that you've sold, you count on them as a sale, but then you have to do a return. That's why I'm glad I have a publisher for most of my stuff, because I don't have to worry about any of that. But I can see where if I was a small, independent person, that would really impact my bottom line if I thought I sold 10,000 copies and then 5,000 got returned that's 5,000 copies I didn't really sell, right? And then what condition do those books return to me in? Are they going to be damaged when they come back to me? Or are they going to be in resellable conditions? If I get a bunch of books back and they're damaged, I can't do anything with them but shred them. So, yeah, that's also a detriment as well, yeah. Awesome, thanks for your question. When you're creating a character, how much research you have to do to make sure you have Good question. <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> I think I think there's a couple things that you have to keep in mind. I mean, a lot of characters that are out there for every publisher are derivatives of something, right? For example, Captain Marvel is really a derivative of Superman. You got Supergirl. You got Batman, Robin. They're all sort of in the same vein. Batman came first, but then before Batman, there was the Shadow. I mean, so you kind of you can't be too hard on it, um, but also if I came out with a guy who looked exactly like Spawn, but I called him Spurn, everybody's going to figure it out pretty quickly. Either it's a parody or I'm just a jerk and I'm working on Spawn. So I try to do things. I try to look at what other people are doing and I try to go the other way. So um, that's why Jason New York City has been so fun to do because I put it out there, and the most often thing I've heard from parents and people looking at it is oh, this is unique, nobody's doing this. And that's why I did that, I wanted something. I didn't want a guy in tights. I wanted something different. Um, and I, I same thing with my Iggy Idiot Caveman comic book. Sure, there's a million caveman comic books around, the Flintstones, and, you know, the Crudes, things like that. I'm doing a comic book about a caveman who sucks at being a caveman. It's a fun thing for kids. And the whole twist is that he's just terrible at it. He's just, he's not good at it at all. And I don't have dinosaurs in the book. I wanted it to be fairly accurate as far as what kinds of animals he you know, encounters and things like that. But otherwise, it's just silly slapstick fun. And, and I, I mean, the character, yeah, he's a derivative of Fred Flintstone, sure. But it's not Fred Flintstone. Like, you're going to put your own twist on whatever you're doing. So. And I think that's the biggest thing, too. Like, even with my characters, you know, they may have started based somewhere, but you, you add your own flavor, your own twist. Um, for me, it's specifically making sure that there's Canadian pieces to it, 
and stuff like that. And um, you know, not just Saskatchewan based, even though that's where I heavily work out of it, but just making sure that it's identifiable as Canadian without always having to be red and white with the maple leaf, but being from certain areas or tied to, related to, uniquely Canadian in some way or shape or form. Anything to add, Colin? For myself, um, I just know specific themes and just the generalness. So it's not really competing on anything, but it's that familiarity. But myself. Well, I'll jump in first before Jason gets going. Uh, honest and truly, for me right now, my character's already part of that. Um, building what we did here with the Canadian Comic Book Alliance and having this group of guys, we, we've, I've already hit the point. You know, the Aurora Man Annual, having all these people together, all these characters together, I'm there. I'm good to go. Yeah, for myself, I just want to tell stories. Um, I, I've never, I didn't get into this because I wanted to draw a Spider-Man or anything like that. It's just, I want to tell stories. So, I'm happy to do whatever I'm doing until I run out of stories to tell. Then I'll, then I'll stop. Yep. Yeah. Answer the question and then we'll wrap. got nothing? Wow, we, we made James quiet. Great question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, and we are at our time, so thank you guys for coming out. Thanks for your questions. We, I appreciate that. Um, those of you that stuck through it, listening to us ramble and just kind of chatter on here, it's been great. Um, and if you have any other questions that you don't want to ask in front of everybody or anything like that, you can come find us. We're in a nice long row in increasing beard size down the row. So you'll start with Jason, and you'll go to James, then Colin, and myself at the end. Yeah, you know, it's, it's how it goes, right? Um, again, thank you guys very much for coming out. Shout out to everybody that was watching on the live stream as well. And uh, yeah, you guys have a fantastic weekend. Thanks, guys.